after e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, we play bishop b5, and after d6, we take the knight. So the only way to take back is with this pawn. So now the move is e5. We're immediately challenging the d6 pawn, and uh, of course the black player should not take the pawn, because then he has a weakness on the c file. These two pawns are doubled up and isolated. So after e5, there's plenty of options we're going to go through. Let's start from d5. The black player wants to keep the pawn structure safe, and after developing the bishop, maybe play e6. And black has quite a lot of pawns in the center. Uh, the pawn, the b pawn is going to the c file. So also black has quite a lot of control of the central squares. So after d5, white continues with d3. It's important because black is threatening to immediately play bishop g4, and we don't want to waste the tempo by playing h3. So black is threatening to play bishop g4, attack the knight and take away uh, the piece that is protecting the square e5, which is important. So now if black plays bishop to g4, we can play b uh, knight to d2. And uh, if we get taken, then we can take back with the knight, and we haven't lost anything. So now black has to go on with the game. He has to develop the pieces and castle the king. He's quite far away from castling, and also he's not going to castle queenside. That's, that's really insane. So black has to develop either e6 or g6 to get the bishop out and then the knight out. Let's go through e6. After e6, black is reducing the bishop to the only possible square e7 for development. So now, anyway, we have to attack the bishop, right? Let's get, let's start getting rid of this bishop. The bishop can either move or take the knight. So let's say bishop goes back, right? Let's say black doesn't want to give up the bishop for a knight. Also because it, it's completely useless trade, right? Because you're going to take back with the knight. So you've literally given the bishop for nothing. Although that is a possibility. After this move, white continues development with the queen. Queen to e2 now. It's always good to put the queen when black has a pawn in e6. Black now has to develop the bishop to e7. It's the only square. Um, let's just remind that g6 is a typical mistake where you play g4 and you trap the bishop. So, um, bishop e7. Or another idea could be knight e7 and knight g6. We're going to go through that as well. Anyway, let's start with, with bishop e7. Now white castles. White's development is somewhat complete. And now black has to develop as well. He ha because he didn't play the knight e7 variation, which we will see later on, black will have to play knight h6 and then castle. This is already quite ugly. Black, white continues with g4. You don't have to worry about your king because the game is quite close. There's a lot of pawns in the center. Black doesn't have any attacking chances at the moment. And so black will have to play the only move, which is bishop back. The sacrificing is completely pointless. It doesn't go anywhere. Bishop g6, and now white continues with knight to b3. I should also mention that a move like c4 is not a problem. We can just take the pawn and win the pawn. Because then the pawn takes and then queen takes back. Black hasn't achieved anything except he just isolated his own c pawn. So knight b3 now is adding pressure to c5. We want to play a move like bishop e3. In this type of game with the Rosolimo when they play d6 and then they have this pawn structure like this. Always try to remember the pawn structures because remembering the move, memorizing the moves is impossible. Remember this, uh, that, that in this specific scenario, pushing this pawn is terrible. For, uh, for black, right? Black should not do that move. If they do that move, it looks like after bishop e3, they will gain a tempo. We just remove the bishop. When you remove the bishop, play knight d2, knight e4 will be available, knight c4 will be available, and black will not be adding any pressure to the center. So after knight to b3 and black castles, for example, it looks like black has finished development, and uh, yeah, but it's still, it's just quite ugly. Now we play bishop e3, and we're gonna go for this pawn. So, by the way, uh, I think this is already clear that this opening that with the Rosolimo is all, all very rarely going to be sharp and, and crazy like some of, the, some of the other games I've been going through in the last videos. This is all going to be positional, uh, but it's important to become strong positional players. We're all going to be fighting for spaces, for squares and for pawns before we actually get an advantage. As mentioned, c4 doesn't, doesn't make sense, loses material. And there's two ways now to stop this, um, this to stop white from winning the pawn. Either queen b6 or pawn to d4. Let's have a look at queen b6 first. We're going to play a4. The idea, obviously, is to play a5. So black's best move now is a5 to stop that from happening. Now we play knight f to d2. Right? This is not difficult to remember because all these moves are forced anyway. And you get the scenario. We're just adding pressure on this square. Uh, when they play the bishop e7 scenario, just add pressure on the c5 square. The bishop is not in the fianchetto. After knight to d2, here's the beauty of this situation. Black is paralyzed. Can't move the knight anywhere. Can't move the bishop anywhere. Can't move the other pieces without just wasting tempos and allowing white to go on with f4. So black can basically only move the king, something like that, or the rooks along this rank. With the queen back and forth. He's got no moves. 
whereas white has more freedom. White's plan is simple. The idea is to play f4 and then double up the rooks, rook f2 and then rook a to f1 and push f5, winning material. Right, so of course we don't get to play moves in a row. That's the plan. So after knight f2, d2, if black moves the rook, for example, right, because black really doesn't have many moves, rook to b8, for example, it's just doubling up the attack on something that can never be taken. And uh, just to mention something else, if you're thinking about queen b4, which comes with an attack with an idea of c4, for example, that also fails because we have just too many defenders to that square. So even c4, pawn takes, pawn takes, and then knight takes. So this idea that black may have of uh, trying to disrupt this knight away so they can take on b2 cannot happen. So now, okay, so in this situation, let's look at a line just to understand how black is paralyzed. So let's see black just open, uh, I don't know, plays a rook to e8, just to make an example. Now we play king to h1, and uh, we will play f4, rook f2, rook f1, and go for f5. So after king to h1, let's just remember how this d4 pawn, as I mentioned already, cannot be played. It's just terrible. White's advantage is like plus 5. So try to understand that this game is closed, so we're going to play on the little things. Knight to c4 now, as we said, we have control of the square e, uh, c4 now. It comes with an attack on the queen. The queen will go. There's plenty of squares uh, available. Uh, a7, b7, c7. Let's say, for example, b7. Now we take the knight. Pawn takes back. And then we play f4. Now f5 will be winning the bishop, because pawn takes, pawn takes, and the bishop can't go to h5 because of the queen. Pushing the pawn to h5 doesn't make any difference. You're still going to play f5. And this queen is completely act, uh, inactive. She is unable to defend the king's side. And so after this, the bishop is already lost. A move like f5, for example, we take it on passant. After the bishop takes, we go knight d6. So you can argue that this fork is unfortunate and that the queen should have just moved somewhere else. But let's look at the plan. So here, we started with rook to, a, uh, to e8 and then king h1. Again, let's let's keep talking about how we punish the d4 move. Knight c4, let's say the queen goes to c7, if this looks like a better square. Also because it defends d6 a bit more together with the bishop. Bishop d2 now wins the spawn. It's inevitable. Right, we've got three pieces attacking that square. And after that pawn is won, the bishop, the knights, the bishop protecting d6, the knight can infiltrate after we push the, the, the past pawn. Black's pieces are completely unable to move literally anywhere. The best move suggested by Black now is rook to a6. But White still continues with the plan f4. We're still going for it. You know, rook f2, rook a to f1. And let's see what happens now if you might argue that now f5 can be played. Yeah, you can still take on Passant, but you can say that after bishop takes, the bishop has a release square and we don't have any fork or anything like that. Well, then in that case, we can take the pawn in c5. Comes with an attack on the rook as well. Anyway, if the rook hadn't moved to a6, which was the best move, but rather to a7. Like, for example, a few moves ago, instead of going to a6, we can play a7. Then we go on with the plan that we mentioned before. We have just too many defenders. Black, black's position is falling apart. We also have a passed pawn. Right, so here we are again. We talked about d4 and uh, how black's position just gets so much worse. And also the plan that we will always be going for, like king h1, f4, and the two rooks doubling up. Black can't move the pieces. So let's talk about a move like f6 now. Black is willing to open this rook, makes perfect sense, and also give a shelter for the bishop, potentially f7 or uh, e8. We take, and uh, the bishop cannot take back because of bishop takes, comes with the fork attacking this and this. And going back, after takes, if black takes with the pawn, then this is a free now. 